All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Bailey Lewis, um, and I am thrilled to lead us in this conversation today with Christina Halverson. Um, thanks for joining us here at the end of a Friday. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have a laid back conversation. And this is fun for me. I hope it'll be fun for you too. I'm sure it will be because it's about one of my favorite things to talk about. I think Christina's too. Uh, I'm sure Christina's too. Uh, it's content strategy. And so I'm not going to make much ado. I just want to dive right in because I think content strategy for some may be a familiar concept and for others may be something that you don't hear too much about or you've heard about a few times and you're not really sure. So Christina, the first question I have for you is, what is content strategy? How do you how do you define it? How do you tell people about it? Oh, let's just jump right in. Right. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having me today. And hi to everybody who has stuck around on the Friday afternoon. Appreciate it. Um, what is content strategy? Well, I have a little, I, this is a longer answer than you maybe wanted. Uh, I wrote a book in 2009 called Content Strategy for the Web. I am by a uh, profession, a content strategist who largely operates within the field of user experience. At the time in 2009, I sort of, there was not really a formal definition for content strategy. And I literally in this book kind of like threw something against the wall. It was like, let's see what sticks. And the definition was content strategy guides planning for the creation, delivery and governance of useful, usable content. And that definition has really kind of held up nicely over time. I mean, I still see it quoted in articles and stuff, which has been really, really gratifying. However, you may have heard of content marketing, your favorite people who you work with, I'm sure everyone in this audience. And uh, content marketing was kind of an adjacent discipline that was exploding at the same time. And over time, content marketing kind of, we're gonna say absorbed. <laughs> phrase content strategy to the point that within especially larger organizations like you could have content strategists sitting on the design team and then content strategists also sitting in marketing and they did two completely different things so i think that the nature of the phrase content strategy is evolving and changing across organizations <clears throat> and that frankly what i'm seeing is there can be content strategy within the enterprise across departments. There can be content strategy within a marketing program. There can be content strategy specific to a website. There can be content strategy across the customer journey within a product environment. So it's it's flexible, it's evolving, uh, and we'll just kind of see where it goes. Yeah, it is, it is a younger field um, of, uh, I guess a subfield. It's not really even a subfield, but as far as our user experience um, um, disciplines concerned, it's young in and of itself. And then content strategy is kind of younger still. Um, and you've talked a lot about how content strategy um, has evolved since um, you started writing about it. One of the first people to start writing and even talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, what what do you see today do you, when you run into to people working with teams or working with um, others um, on projects or just talking in general? Mm -hmm. Are people typically um, familiar with the phrase now or uh, is there still a lot of, of um, uh, uncertainty or questions about it? What's your experience with that? Yep, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, so brain traffic is our, is my consultancy. And so we are called in at, at first we were called in largely to work on really large, messy website projects where, you know, they had been working on the design and they'd been working on the tech and like still the like website was somehow broken and they would kind of finally go, Oh, it's the content. Like no matter how awesome the design is and how clean and powerful and, you know, and well constructed the, the tech is and the platform and behind it, if the content sucks, it doesn't matter. Like nobody cares. They're going to hit that website. They, they are not coming for the design, right? They're going to hit that website and they're going to leave. So we would be called in for that. And in that instance, we did have to do a lot of educating around like larger teams around what content strategy is and what we did and so on. And I will say that one of the top questions that I tend to get when I speak at conferences or in training is, how can I explain to my colleagues what it is that I do? And so, and especially now with the conflation of like marketing content strategy and website, it's more complicated. So 
it depends. It depends on the organization. It depends on the culture. It depends on how mature the user experience team is. Um, you know, for example, there are. I see content strategist as a as a job title and as a role and being relatively well understood in within a lot of higher ed environments, specifically because websites in those in those organizations are really really important. Uh, with some of the newer tech companies that we that we work with and who come to our events um what used to be called content strategy they have now they're now starting to shift over to content design and that is really the term that we are using more now even at brain traffic when we talk about the role of like the person who owns the content within the design and build process as we call that more of like a content designer does that answer your question sometimes when i talk i just like <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't have um, an agenda. I just uh, yeah. glad to be able to talk talk to you today about all of this. Um, and yeah. it's, it's a really good point too. I know you've talked, you've written about this a lot. You talk about this a lot. There are so many different names for what a content strategist does, and it can mm -hmm. vary from organization to organization. That's true for a lot of different disciplines in in totally. the world. But content strategy is really one. Um, it's it's like uh, Eskimos have how many different um, uh, names for snow? It's kind yeah. of, the type of yeah. so. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, a little bit more about that. You say that we're starting to to call. Uh, you're, you're starting to see others doing this. You're starting to do this, calling people content designers. Mm -hmm. um, how about some of the other names that we hear? Content specialist, um, content. Um, uh, writer, um, yeah. web writer, analyst, you know. UX writer, website writer, yeah. UX website, content designer, strategist. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, again, these terms all get mushed up. And, and you know, this, I think it's a really interesting conversation and a frustrating conversation because within our community, within the tech community design, like the larger community of people that make stuff, we would love to have one body going, these are the job titles and these job titles do these roles and responsibilities and no, nothing shall change. And these are all fixed and immutable. And it's just not going to happen. Like it's not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is that our organizations, like in size, in culture, in level of design or technical maturity with their, you know, systems and processes and talent uh, location. I mean, all of these things feed into what stuff is called, right? It just does. And so I find that what's sometimes more helpful is to take a step back and really examine roles within the design and build process. So that instead of worrying about like, what should my job title be, uh, that, that we begin as we're organizing teams and as we're beginning to understand uh, accountability and responsibility, tasks, deliverables, et cetera, that we're focusing a little bit more on like roles and activities and accountability. And if we can go from there, what we find is that within some organizations, you know, a content strategist, for example, is also doing research. They're also sitting and doing QA with the tech team. They're also doing copywriting. They're also negotiating content requests from various or you know various parts of the organization so as much as i would like to be able to say here's how things are shaking out i don't think they are and i don't think that they will i think that it's important it's, and it's frustrating because when you're out there looking for a job you want to know what to type in and what to look for right and i mean if you go type in content strategist on linkedin jobs right now like you're going to get 80 different flavors of it so i uh, I'm sorry if that's a frustrating answer, but you know, in terms of like different titles that I see, I mean, it's, you know, I, there's, there's as many different flavors of tech job titles as there are te technologies, you know, and tools, uh, same for designers. I mean, we have visual designer, we have technical designer, we have content designer, we have UX designer, you know, I'm, I mean, it's just, it's all over the place. And so, I would, I would suggest that it is really interesting, especially within organizations like this one, to continually talk about what are the titles and the roles that you're seeing? How is 
your, where does your, like one of the first questions I ask when I come into an organization is when they're talking to me about their content, I'm like, now who do you report up through? Because if they're reporting up through, you know, the CIO versus the CMO versus the CTO versus HR, like that's going to have an effect on how they see their role and their level of accountability when it comes to the content that is being shared with audiences. Yeah. And um, is that how, um, I guess at, at Brain Traffic, how you all are structured and then how you recommend your client structure as well based on their, uh, someone's role, someone's maybe skills, everyone else who's working around them, that kind of mm -hmm. thing? Yeah, I mean, for, for it's different for us, right? I mean, we're a content strategy consultancy. Like I have content, I'm a senior content strategist, I have regular content strategists, and I have website and UX writers, right? Like those are, the, and those are kind of the services that we offer. One service that we do offer is going in and taking a really close look at design operations and saying, you know, okay, you've got all these designers, here's their relationship with the, with the tech team, here's how they are interacting with user experience strategist or design ops, and where does content fit into that? And then sort of identifying roles that are required and then crafting job descriptions. That is, that is something that we do help with. But we, we never go in with like a, here's how this should look for you because everybody is so different. I warned them during tech that I tend to like, I'm one of these, like I'm, I'm terrible with virtual. It's much better when it's on stage and I can just be all body. So sorry in advance if I'm giving anybody uh, vertigo. I'm glad you're seasick. Yeah. The lights in my room just went out because they're on a timer. And so I'm going to, I was going to try to turn them back on, but that's I think right. That's everybody do that. Every it's time to stretch. Yeah. stretch for well, at some point the sun may, I mean, it's the sun may come in and like hit me in the face and then I'm going to have to move. So they're still not coming back on. That's fine. We'll just, uh, that's what, you know what? We can't tell you got a nice glow behind you. I mean, you look really like angelic. It's nice. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but what do you getting getting back to, to how content works on teams a little? Um, I know a lot of teams out there do not have anyone who is a writer on their team, a content totally. strategist, anything. What do you say to those teams short of you need to have this person, um, but if the resources just aren't there or something like that? Yeah, you know, it, this is such a pain point. I mean, it, no matter what size organization you're working in, and I have seen large organizations that are like, yes, it's time to invest in content. And then like, oh, we have to cut. Let's start with the content people that we hired. And it's so difficult because content is like the beating heart of any website, right? Like you cannot design a good user experience for bad content or, I mean, it just is. But the, I think that the thing is that uh, everybody's got Microsoft Word. Right. Like everybody's got pages. Everybody's got Google Docs like and everybody can write. Everybody can write. So like how hard can it be? And I think that that is kind of the the lens that management and upper, you know, the, the folks with the with the, per, the who control the purse strings. That, that's kind of what they're thinking. Like just 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 do the writing. Like how hard can it be? Just get it done. And of course, what we know is that it's not that simple. It's you've got to be working on content this at the same time that you're working on design you need to be thinking about consistency of voice and tone and messaging across the customer journey you've got to be thinking about i mean the the arguments that i have seen on design teams about what copy to put on the button you know you need to understand best practices there um and then the larger the website is, you need to be able to kind of negotiate requests that are coming in from all these different departments to ensure that they are purposeful and meaningful and actually map to user needs. The only thing that I have ever seen help kind of elevate that understanding within organizations is to sit people down in, frankly, in user um, user research groups or even sometimes user testing and working with real content to get feedback about whether or not it is meeting needs and expectations, whether it makes sense, whether it is like causing them to pause because it's poorly written. But if we can't demonstrate to the people who are asking us to do this work, how important that content is, we're not going to get the dedicated resources that we need. So that that's kind of the first piece is that, yeah, if you don't have it here, here are some ways to make the case 
to get it. It's got to be, and it actually has to be one of two things. It either needs to be addressing a pain point or it needs to be helping to somebody to look like a rock star. Like those are the only two ways that you're going to get support for content. Um, other than that, I mean, if you are a designer or if you're, or if you are building and the, let's say for example, metadata, like how many times have you been stuck with the build and nobody delivered the metadata and you're just like, well, we're getting ready to go into QA. I better just like write some stuff and hope for the best. Uh, or you get the metadata and you're like, this is not mapping page to page or whatever, then you're stuck writing. And in that instance, you know, making sure that you're tracking your time so that people understand how much of an investment it is for you to actually get that work done. And then secondly, taking some responsibility to make sure that it is mapping to best practices, whether that is with SEO or accessibility, like there are, there are best practices around basic metadata that, that we should be responsible for as, as uh, designers in tech. And then in design, you know, when you, if you are working more on like the front end, it is your job to understand the basics of good UX writing. And also I think to be able to communicate to uh, marketers, for example, who are like, yes, we do need 2,500 words on the About Us page, to be able to help them see that content through the user's eyes, right? For example, I just, I just I was talking to a client today who they're redoing their website and they're super excited. They keep calling it the marketing website. And I'm like, well, who goes to use this website? And they, and after talking about it for a little bit, they were like, you know, actually it's what's really important to us is we're recruiting and hiring like crazy right now. And of course they're going to be coming to this website. And I was just like, okay, the content that describes your product is completely, I like nobody's going to understand it because it's so tech heavy and so inside of baseball language. And so being able to like talk to people and help them see through the eyes of the user constantly coming back around to that is also really important to help kind of raise the awareness of the importance of the content that's going on the website or being designed into the product. Yeah, that's, there's a lot of really great um, thoughts there. Um, proving that's important with uh, user testing. And um, would, uh, would you say that if user testing isn't something that's part of your project, there's a way that um, someone on a team who knows that they need a content resource or someone who, who is capable of the content work, um, uh, a way for them to, to put together um, an inexpensive or kind of do-it-yourself user test that could help make their case even if it's not part of their budget? Yeah, sure. I mean, haven't we all kind of like come to the, if your mom doesn't get it, then you, you're in trouble, right? Like the, the, whole, the whole idea of plain English and the importance of plain English across any website or product environment is so critical, especially in our increasingly diverse society where a lot of people, English is their second language, you know, that that is kind of a simple call your mom and see if, see if she gets it. Or, 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 or for example, I, you know, let's sit down and read this aloud because good, I'll use website content as an example, good website content should read it should be relatively conversational, right? And if you're reading it aloud and you sound like a robot or you sound like a brochure that nobody's ever going to pick up, like that demonstrates in a really tangible way, oh, this really should be redone or maybe we want to bring in somebody who is like a professional with words to give us input. And, and you know, in terms of in terms of in terms of just sort of like having an inexpensive investment sometimes the smallest pilot project can have a really really huge impact within a team or within an organization so i mean i've seen teams who have taken the the let's say the careers page of the website or a couple of pages around that um and done maybe even like an a b test where they they rewrite one page sort of to make it very user friendly and, and easy to understand and put, you know, the things that are important to job applicants at the top versus like burying it at the bottom in the bottom footer with the link that you need to click, you know, rewriting that and then even just doing A-B tests and coming back with the, you know, and talk to marketing like they should if they can't do a good A-B test, what are they doing? Like, go make a friend there and then come back with those results and just say, look, we had four really qualified candidates go through and submit applications from this page. On this page, 
maybe we had zero candidates or maybe we had 60 candidates that all sucked because they didn't really fully understand culture or the benefits or you know the job the the nature of the of the department or the category of the job that they i mean whatever now i'm just making stuff up but but it that's another way another way into it okay yeah um and and keeping with the the track of uh how content strategy works within a team and and getting that content resource when do you bring content strategy into the process? So how does it fit in with the rest of um, creating a, a digital product of any kind or any you kind of product? You bring them in right away. I mean, that is, you know, we we often talk about how content breaks stuff in the 11th hour. Like you call the writer because you're like, now it's time for the words. Everything else is done. We just got to replace the Lorem Ipsum. We got to fill in the wireframes. We got to make sure all the fields in the CMS have been checked off, you know, and then the whole thing falls apart because because the design was created without considering actual content requirements based on user needs and business goals. So bringing in the content person whether it is the, I mean, or maybe it's the writer. It doesn't have to be somebody with like formal training or like tied job title as content strategist. Bring them in at the start because anybody worth their salt who is creating content for digital products and services is going to have questions right at the beginning of the process and if though that are specific to the content, and if those questions are left to the end of the project, to the process, they're going to ask those questions and people will be like, oh, it's never really occurred to me and then everything falls apart so there you know and i know that we all talk about wanting a seat at the table right like this is everybody's complaint for time eternal well if they called me first or why wasn't i consulted or you know ux people need to seat at the table they, if nobody's going to invite you to sit at the table like go invite yourself drop in on these meetings i guess it's harder in zoom but you know contact the project lead and just say, I'd really like to sit in and just listen because the more information I can have up front, the more it's gonna inform my work later. And, and be assertive about it, be friendly, be assertive, be make sure that they understand that the stuff that broke the project the last time, you can get in front of that. That doesn't have to be that way. Um, yeah, bring them right at the start. I mean, the writer, the content strategist is your best friend. Once you have had a content strategist on a project, you will not go back because everybody hates the 11th hour meltdown. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you said that uh, the content strategist is thinking about how the information that's trying to be communicated or the tasks that someone might need to complete, um, use the career page example. Um, it's all related to users' needs and business goals. So it's Correct. not... I, uh, I, I don't know if you uh, experience this sometimes, but sometimes I um, uh, find people talking about content strategy as just uh, just an art. At the end, you write some really nice words that sound good and then you're yeah. off. Um, but it's directly, what you're saying is it's directly tied to the goals of the project on the business side and the user side. Yeah, right? otherwise, why do you have, why are the words there? Like if, it, if it's not, if they're not tied to what the product or service is supposed to be doing, for the end user, or if it's not meeting the end user's needs, then it's just nice to have content. There's just decoration. Like there's no point. I I actually, again, I actually was talking to another uh, consultant or agency, I guess, that was looking for some input around content strategy today. And they were talking about this project that they'd been working on for two weeks. And they're like, yeah, we really, we realized that when we came to content, we were at this just sort of huge stumbling block. We were hoping you could help us. And within five minutes, I was like, well, how would you describe your user understanding? Like, do you, do you know what users want? They didn't even, the client had not even identified or prioritized audiences. Like that conversation hadn't even been, you know, and how can you design a website for an end user that you haven't defined or that you don't understand? And, and that is the kind of substantive thing that a content person can catch right up at the beginning. Because even, even if you are doing, like let's say you're an information architect and you're gonna do, a card sort exercise and either you come in with the cards or you do a big brainstorm with post-it notes about different kinds of information that the audiences might need and then you go through and you sort them and now you've got your you've got the bones of your you know site map or your or your content model or whatever great it's so easy to create a label 
and organize labels and deliver a site map and have no real understanding around this, the actual substance of what needs to go on that page and what people are looking for or looking to accomplish when they hit it. And what ends up happening then is you've got just this glut of unnecessary content or and or you've missed huge pieces that people were coming to the website to do. I mean, again, this other website, they when once they came to, oh yeah, a really important thing is careers. I was like, you have nothing about careers anywhere on this website. And they're like, oh yeah, we do. It's in the footer, apply to work here. And I was just like, that doesn't, like, that doesn't make any sense. That's not where the content belongs. Yeah, and that actually made me think of, of something else um, that, I know people talk about a lot, but I think it's still worth repeating. Um, can you can you talk about how people do or don't read online? Can you talk about how they interact with your work? Sure. sure. I, you know, I will. This is where it can be extremely powerful for us all to take a moment to be self-aware when we are browsing the web or when we are using our phones and to pay attention to our own reading habits, uh, where we slow down, where we get impatient, where we miss information and have to go back to redo something. Uh, because, you know, there's a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Norman Nielsen group. They've been around for 20 years and very early on, they did some eye tracking studies and some heat mapping studies to sort of say, oh, people don't read online, they scan. So everything's got to be short paragraphs and everything has to be bulleted lists. And I used to, I used to teach this too, you know, people are not there to do a lot of reading. Well, that's not necessarily true for all kinds of content. I mean, that's, I don't subscribe to uh, magazines or newspapers, you know, in print. I do it all digitally and I have read very, very, very long pieces of content online. Um, so I, I really think it depends on the user's mental model. It depends on what the content is for. It depends on what they're, you know, what they showed up to do. Um, I, you know, I will say that just even from just an accessibility standpoint, though, when you are thinking about how you're going to present and format content on the page, you want to be creating that content for the screen, right? I mean, even for like I'm a real fan of the Guardian long reads, which are long reads, but even for those, they're not gonna have like a 500 word paragraph, right? Like they're gonna break stuff up to kind of give your eye a quick rest. So yeah, that's my long winded answer. <laughs> right, and it, all, it sounds like it all goes back to um, user needs and business goals. Um, as you, you know, you're talking about putting the, the carers link in the footer, but it's all about careers. Um, mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. That's not where people are looking for it. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I taught, when I, when I kind of introduced that definition of content strategy for open discussion, I really was very intentional about, you know, this is what the strategy is for. It's for guiding plans. Here's what the plans should be for creating and delivering and take and caring for content, but not just any content useful usable content. And that, <laughs> that means user, right? But it also, I mean, useful also means useful to the business. Because again, if there's no, and some people like to say purposeful, right? Like that content has to have a purpose. It has to either, maybe its purpose is to help assist a user. Maybe its purpose is to help drive people to download something, you know, and like give, give up a lead in the, you know, an email address or whatever in, along the way. Uh, maybe it is the metadata that's being included so that when people do an internal site search, you know, it is the results that come back are meaningful and not just like a big pile of crap, like most internal site searches will, will return. Um, so that, that those words and, and coming at it through that lens is really critical when you're online. It's content that is kind of nice to have on a website that's serving a purpose is no, it's no good. It gets in people's way. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll change tax just a little bit because we've been talking for a long time about teams and how content strategy fits into teams and um, the, uh, the, the value, the importance of content strategy and where it comes mm -hmm. from the process. Um, 
And you've, you've spoken about this a little bit, but I kind of want to hear about a project that you've worked on lately where there was a really big problem that might have been causing um, the business revenue or something like that, and how content strategy, um, obviously with the help of other fields, but how content strategy helped to solve that problem at the end of the day? <laughs> this is a question I should have... <laughs> I should have had the answer to before. Um, <laughs> let's see how, 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 content, how content strategy helps <laughs> solve a large business problem. Well, mm -hmm. you know, what's interesting about that question, I will say is that we often find that rather than content, the, rather than being called in to solve a business problem with content strategy, what happens is that the process of content strategy actually really exposes business problems. Like it exposes the cracks, right? Or it, it sort of uncovers, like we lift up the rocks and we're like, well, we can't have help you in defining content for this area of the website if you know the department that is supposed to own that website is scrambling around and they don't know who owns the content and they don't, well, that's like a smaller business problem. Well, okay, so here, so here, here's an example. So about a year and a half ago, pre in the before times, uh, I was working with a, a global organization and had been called in to assist specifically with their European division, uh, which was very fancy. Uh, so I was in London a couple of times. And, you know, when they called me in, they were like, it was through more of a marketing lens. They were like, okay, well, we really want to double down on content uh, and kind of like, helping to establish thought leadership. This is a big global design agency. We want to help establish thought leadership and we want to create yeah. unique website properties that people will go to, you know, when they're looking for source, the source of truth around these various topics. Yeah. And, uh, and also, and this is Europe was saying, and also we really want to get the attention of global brand because we feel like they're cranking out a lot of content, but they're not giving us enough uh, exposure in that. And we need to have our, our offices have more exposure within the stuff that they're doing. Okay, great. So what they, what they wanted was a nice, neat little framework defining what kinds of content they should be creating. But over the course of our first two day workshop, we uncovered the following problems. They did not have any kind of specific documented research on the core audiences that they wanted to reach, which were, uh, business leaders in a, in a couple of very specific uh, industries. They did not know what kinds of information those leaders were looking for. They did not know the other publications that those leaders were reading. They did not know what those top problems are that those leaders were looking to solve that they could help solve. <clears throat> and the content that was being created by global brand in digging into it was not doing anything for the company. It was uh, we call it vanity content. It was content that was like, look at us, look at how special we are, look at all the things that we think. But like, it was not targeted to client needs at all. And then we dug deeper into that. And we, I mean, what ended up happening is we identified all this dysfunction within global brand. We were able to um, better position the European office in terms of like what they wanted to offer to this audience that they got to know a lot a lot more deeply we got the attention of like the ceo and the cmo and it was and then they they ended up like completely reorganizing the brand teams across the entire world and it was simply all the way you know that impact from very very simple like well what is it that you what kind of content is it that you're wanting to create and why all of that stuff came up from that so we see this all the time, that, that conversations around content ultimately end up around conversations about the business. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a workshop and all of a sudden somebody's like, we, I really feel like we're doing more business strategy right now than content strategy. And I'm just like, you can't decide what kinds of content to create if you don't understand what it's for. That's part of why I love doing it is because it's never, it's never just about the words. Yeah, yeah. Um... That's uh, that. That's a great point. Yeah, uncovering problems is part of the problem. <laughs> is part of solving. Well, and I, but you know another thing, and I'm sure every single person here can relate to this too. 
when you're in the weeds, when you've got your hands on the product or the service or whatever it is that you're working on, sometimes you have a real clear purview into these larger, whether it's dysfunctions or lack of resources or lack of clear documentation, like whatever, you see where the problem is. You can diagnose the problem and you have exactly zero opportunity or purview to do anything about it. And that is, that is enormously frustrating. And, you know, there, I always tell people there are a couple of ways to respond to that. You can either decide that you want to be a part of the conversation and play politics within the organization and figure out how to get involved there. You can decide to keep your head down and just do your work and affect what you can within your current job responsibilities and, you know, leave it there. Or if it's really bad, you can find a different job. So those are, but, but I, I was in my twenties, I, I was, I was a real bad employee because I was just a huge know-it-all. I was just like, I see all the problems and I can fix all the problems and no one is listening to me. And then, so then I went out on my own. <laughs> I was unemployable. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the, the UX and content strategy world should, should be grateful for that actually. Yeah. Uh, worked out, worked out great for all of us. Um, yeah. And I think I'm going to, um, I know we have probably some questions that have popped up in, in the Slack channel and I want to go over there and take a look at that in just a minute. Um, but I was going to wrap up, um, I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything huge that we that want to make sure to ask you about. Um, but I think, and you spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I, I think, um, well, this is a very future looking time in general, more so than even usual. What do you see for the future of content strategy, content design, um, whatever we'll be calling it um, after a while here, or whatever we call it in, in any given organization? What trends are you seeing? How do you see it evolving over the next five to 10 to 15 years? Yeah, um, I mean, that's a great question. and. Uh, what I have learned, I mean, I've been doing this work for almost 20 years and what I have, what I have learned is that some organizations are like all systems go and they are, they have I diagnosed the issue. They have invested in the resources. They have built out the teams. They have <clears throat> made, you know, the, put the user in the center and understand the importance of, of content within the user experience. Then there are companies who I swear to you have been calling us over and over for the past 15 years with exactly the same problem. And so those companies are going to be wrangling with, I think, content strategy and, and lack of maturity around content strategy and operations for many, many years to come because what leadership values does not, is not at the level of user experience, for example. So, I mean, I think, you know, we talk about in, in a lot of times people call us and they're like, well, we're just now figuring out how important content is and we really want to make it, you know, we want to make sure that it's part of the fabric of our organization and you have 12 weeks to do it. And I'm just like, yo, you know, it's not, it's like a step. It's like, it's like steps towards real full maturity within your content operations. And that just takes time. So I think that what we will continue to see is that the principles of content strategy more and more, especially around websites, will remain active and will continue to kind of mature within some of these larger organizations that are dealing with huge unwieldy websites. I do think that uh, product companies that are younger and kind of were born in the age of the internet, internet and were born in you know, the age of mobile, a lot of those really successful companies started out with content strategists or content designers, uh, mm -hmm. and they're continuing to invest and reinvest in that. So, I mean, I guess that is to say, I think that there will always be, now it has been established that content is important, that it is critical to the user experience, that there is a specialized skill set that really does apply, uh, that, that should be introduced early in the process. What, you know, whether or not, and I think that that skill set will continue to become more and more specialized, frankly, um, which is great. Uh, but I, but 
it really will just depend on, I think that the problems that we were solving when I wrote this first draft of this book 11 years ago, 12 years ago, I people are still buying that book. People are still like, oh my God, this book is changing the way that I'm doing design 12 years later because those problems are not gonna go away. <laughs> They're just not. It's the same basic, we need to put the user in the center of things. And that is a very, very difficult thing to keep your eye on the larger the team and the, you know, the nuances of the culture and, and whatever, like the, the core set of challenges is just not going to change. Yeah. That's, yeah. I can't, I, I remember several years ago, I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to be giving my content strategy one-on-one presentation for the rest <laughs> of my life. And I just need to be okay with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, look, see the sun is coming in my, eye. okay. Now we're going to switch over to the boring white background where uh, a year ago I was like, oh, I need to get something up here. And I just never did. Sorry, sorry, virtual conference attendees. A little bit of color off to the, off to one side. Yeah, um, what can I do? I don't know, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, yeah, it, it, it sounds like you're saying that's, we're not, we're not anywhere, um, some of us are really far along with content strategy from where where the where the discipline was 15 years ago. Some are just at those beginning stages again. Yeah, which is fine. Yeah, and some people are kind of circling the drain. Uh, but, but it's the question is not it's not the same kind of a question as what's the future of tech, right? That's a much different question because that that is. I mean, there's a te technology arises not only out of, it rises out of human problems and opportunities that we either see or have created for ourselves. Content is basically just like, I mean, it's, it's more people focused than probably any other part of our discipline, you know, because that content is why people show up at a website. That's the whole reason they show up is to get something done and content is required in order for them to do that. And so, the future of content depends organization to organization where people are at. That's it. Yeah. Well, I'm going to flip over to the Slack channel. Um, I want to flip over to the Slack channel. Can I <laughs> flip over to the Slack channel? It's a virtual people. conference. Anything can happen. A chance. I know. I know. Right uh, there. It really does kind of feel that way. Um, and. Oh, you guys have been busy. Awesome. Uh, yeah, if uh, <laughs> if you're looking and find the thread before I do, let me know. Um, the questions thread? Yeah. I don't know, man. Uh, I don't know. Two, how long does it take um, content professionals to find a thread on Slack here? <laughs> <laughs> Can we just type in content? I would like to say I was talking about this. You guys have... How many hundreds of channels and none of them are dedicated to content? None of them. That changes today, my friends. We need Somebody to create that channel. I want to see a swell of membership and excitement and engagement. I'm going to say engagement a lot now. <laughs> All right. I am really struggling with this thread. Um, but if y'all, um, oh, I found it as soon as I said that. Okay. Let me just go. Great. Um, Content as part of A-B testing is usually one of the lowest lift tests that can create the highest impact ROI. You're right, Ashley Clayton. Good work. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead, oh, Christy. I finally I was talking to myself. Oh, wait. Actually, you know, I'm going to give a little tidbit, and I've told this to some people. I graduated. I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota right now, and I've lived in Minnesota since 96, but I graduated from Edmond Memorial High School very, very long time ago. So I, when you guys called, I was like, Oklahoma home so i'm glad to see you that's uh, it anybody else anybody else graduate from edmund hit me up all right sorry question meaningful questions for me <laughs> we actually have some, i'm just reading these they, we have some very good questions um Great. and so i'm going to start from the top and, and go go down as long as we have some time this is this is one that yeah this is very interesting so we have a question asking, how do you determine the return on investment of content strategy efforts to executives and other stakeholders? Um, 
how do you, what do you show them to prove its value when you're asked to show the ROI? Yep. So I always say that there are two ways to demonstrate the impact of content strategy, either by making money or by saving money. And, and which one of the, I mean, which one of those that you choose to focus on will depend on what leadership cares about that day or like what they have cared about for the last two weeks. Cause if we, there is one thing that we know about leadership is that by and large, they're pretty fickle. I mean, we always joke about like the CEO that gets on the plane in New York. And then by the time they get to San Francisco, they're like, all right, I read a book on the plane and now we're going agile. We're all going out, you know? And so it's really important to stay in tune with like, what is their hot topic right now? Is it, we have churn in this department. Um, we have, is it, we are not generating enough leads uh, because the website, whatever we get, we get people to the website and then we can't, you know, take them through the journey on the website to get them to, to close on the form. Is it, we are not getting qualified job applicants and that's making me crazy. Like what's important is to identify either that pain point or whatever opportunity it is that they're excited about. And then you have to choose whether it's a pilot project or even just like a small set of activities where you can really dive into the content and then demonstrate the change that occurred. And, but, but just generally, you know, and that may even be like having a content strategist or coming at, coming at a process from a different angle um, to maybe it, maybe it's that the, you know, department lead, they're going nuts because you've missed every single deadline for the last six months. Well, now you introduce a content strategy and suddenly you are right on time and everybody's happy and you hit that deadline and you're like, you know why? Because we had this, this new skill set involved in the process. So again, it is a, it's a sales process for you, for all of us. If we want, if we want to demonstrate change, we have to sell it. And you can't sell something effectively unless you know who you're selling to and what it is that they want. So that's where to begin to uh, think about how you're going to demonstrate value. So figure out what the pain point is or how... Um... How you can make somebody feel like a rock star. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to repeat. And, what I you say some, and I will say sometimes it's sort of like putting a square peg in a round hole. Like... Oh, you care about Agile? Let me show you how content strategy can contribute to more effective, you know, whatever. I mean, that's, yeah. And what do you show them? Is it an, an sometimes an analytics thing? Or are there other ways to track, okay, this is what it was before? Especially numbers, if I guess, you know, talk, a lot of exact Numbers are really good. I think qualitative, qualitative feedback is good. I think... You know, sometimes, I mean, like a really, really easy example is, okay, your help content sucks and you're getting a ton of calls in customer service. Well, you go find the, your contact in customer service who is tracking call volume around like, or, or you say, what are the top two problem questions that you're getting? Because they all know what they are. And then you go to the website and you really fix those pages and make sure those questions are coming up and the right answers are coming up. And then you go back, you publish them and you go back 10 days later and you're like, has anything changed? And now you've got very, very specific correlation of how really digging into content, not just from a clarity perspective, but from, you know, through user experience lens is, is having an impact on business performance. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, great advice. And going to the customer service people because they get all the complaints, I would imagine. Um, I'm telling you, customer service people and customer service people and salespeople are two of your most valuable research groups. <laughs> uh, they talk, they're the ones that are talking to the customer. Yeah, right. Yep. They're the ones that get all the all, all the bad and hopefully some of the good. Yeah. But, but watch out for salespeople because sometimes what they'll do is, oh, I just had somebody, I had one person ask for me for this at two o'clock and now it is a crisis and we need to add this whole new section to the website. And that's, you got to like chill those people out. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, some other really good questions here. Uh, I want to make sure we have some time. Um, for them. So what, another question, what are your, from the, from the Slack, what are your tips for usability testing for pieces of content or 
information architecture. So when you're testing te testing the success, I guess, of a piece of content or information architecture, do you have tips for doing that? Well, I mean, the you know, in that instance, if we're talking about usability testing particularly, there's you want to check findability, right? Whether it is, and usually that's on the browse to find side of it, the front end, can you get to this piece of content? And so then you're looking at nav labels, you're looking at organization, which is all related very directly to content strategy, obviously. Um, or you're looking at user understanding. So that user testing tends to be less qualitative and a little bit more binary. Like, did, were you able to accomplish this? Did you understand that, right? If you're talking more about like user user research, I'm sorry, that what I just described is like usability testing. Like, can you get to the thing? Can you find the thing? Can you understand the thing? If you're talking more about like user research or user testing, then you can get a little bit more into like the qualitative feedback. And that can be anything from like, did this change the way that you perceived this product or service? Did it, you know, uh, do you feel that you have a clear understanding of the culture for this, for this uh, company and tell us more about that? Um, but that is, that is less binary and can get a lot more like, what is it that you are trying to communicate? What is it that you are trying to accomplish? What is the user need in the business? You know, like here or describing like, here's the problem set that you are trying to solve out here. Go find what you need on the website and then talk to me about whether or not it specifically addresses your needs and if so, why or why not, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, and, and in terms of like tips, if you're not doing it right now, just start really small. Like don't feel, I, I find that in research and in usability and user testing, a lot of times people feel like it has to be some big complex, you know, protracted effort that is going to take 12 to 16 weeks and is going to result in like a giant PDF or in like a 120 slide presentation. And that you just don't need that to get to the information that you're looking for. A book that I, I swear I recommend in every single uh, talk that I give is called Just Enough Research by Erica Hall. It's I saw somebody posted book apart. It's up. It may even be categorized in that. Why are you laughing? Do you love that book? Uh, yes. And also I saw it. I saw it go by in the Slack earlier today. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I will. I will. Um, I, I will say that Erica is also one of my very dearest friends, but it really is like the most Okay, I'm just bragging. Now I'm just name dropping. Who are we kidding? <laughs> it's a really, really great. It's just so it's so accessible, and it is just if you're interested in getting content right, it's a really, really great book to read. Um, and I do think we have time for a few more questions. Um, and someone cut me off if uh, you know if that's what we need to do. Um, but we we have a few left, and it'd be nice to get. Um, people's questions in front of you, Christina. Um, so um, so this is kind of a two-parter, but it, from, okay, so the question says, from a company's perspective, how do you know when you have enough content work, I assume work to hire a full-time content strategist and how can the design leader or manager start to sculpt the request for a content strategist and line up enough work and projects for them to prove that need? So that's a good question that I'm not quite sure how to answer. Uh, uh, I mean, how, how do you know when you're ready for one? It's when content becomes a real, it's when everybody's like, okay, yes, we are all fully aligned that content is important, that we need to be doing more research around it, that there's, we need more of it, or we need to prune back what it is. And now, and, and then it becomes a hot potato. Right. Okay. And then, and so the, you're like, we're asking marketing to kill it. Well, marketing can't deal with it. Okay. Well, let's ask our UX team to deal with it. Well, they don't, when they got to talk to marketing and they're already fully booked for the next launch. So when it becomes a hot potato that nobody is really willing to own, then it's time to bring in a resource and somebody to own it. Right. Uh, but in, in terms of like how helping to sort of figure out how to identify and scope different projects to be able to kind of onboard a content strategist, that is really going to depend on, again, the size of the team, the size of the company, um, how many UX and tech resources you already have in play, what's on their plates, 
Um, but I, you know, anything that comes back into, uh, if you think, if you consider the content life cycle, right, which is just from ideation, like we've identified a need for content or we've identified a desire for content <clears throat> all the way through to it is time to archive or delete this content, right? Once you start to kind of identify what those activities are uh, and sort of um, see who's who's dealing with what right now and whether or not it is the right way or the smart way for them to be applying their skill set, then you can sort of start to identify, okay, these activities and deliverables that this person is responsible for can go into that. I mean, it's like hiring for any job description, especially within a growing company. Um, so I guess that's kind of the best, the best I can do to address that. Yeah. And it sounds very similar to what you were saying earlier about, um, looking at the, the needs and how content strategists can fit into those needs in a given project or organization. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I do, and I want to make sure that it's not so much like, where do we fit in the content strategist, but where can the content strategist help shape and contribute to key outcomes? within this process. And again, a great way to look at that is what broke our project the last six times. Like what came up at the last minute and it's almost always content. Great. All right, thank you. That's that's all for us, but we hope that you enjoyed our conversation about content strategy. We hope to see a content channel coming soon. Um, and thank you so much, Christina, for all your words of wisdom today. Really, uh, really enjoyed it. Absolutely, you're welcome. Thanks for having me.